Hello, everybody. Welcome to MIR Talk. My name is Kaeza Fern, and I'm the Director of Communications at MIR. We are so glad to be getting together for another MIR Talk. And I am very excited that we will be introducing Professor Rupert Reed. After that, we'll have a question and discussion period with people from the wider MIR community. And then we'll open it up to some questions and comments from all of you in our audience. Before we begin, just a few words about MIR. We are continuing to set up MIR experiments and we're so appreciative of any donations that you can make to support the costs of experimental materials. If you can, please make a monthly donation. It makes a big difference. You can go to mir.org forward slash donate. And we are really grateful for your contributions. You can also write to community at mir.org to be in touch. So I will tell you about Rupert Reed. Rupert Reed is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, um, Great Britain, former spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion and co-director of the new Moderate Flank Incubator. He is the author of several books, including This Civilization is Finished, Parents for a Future, and Why Climate Breakdown Matters. We're very grateful to have him on, yes, holding it up for us there. Excellent. We are really grateful, yes, to have uh, him on Mir Talk today. And anybody who has questions that come up while Professor Reed is presenting, you can send them along either to Peter Dines in the chat, uh, who will be showing up as co-host shortly, or else to myself. Okay, Professor Reed, we are so interested to hear what you have to say today. So you can take it away. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here. And when I say here, I, I mean with a group of people who I think are uh, likely to be nearly all really very well informed about uh, what is going on and about some of the stuff we can do about it. So I'm just going to talk uh, fairly informally uh, at, a, at a fairly high uh, level uh, about um, some of what I or we are trying to bring to that equation. And then we'll have a nice long time for uh, a Q&A, which I'm really looking forward to in a general uh, discussion. So I want to start off just with a few words, not too much, because I suspect you all know a great deal about it, about the uh, seriousness of our uh, situation. Uh, some of you will be aware of uh, also this book, um, which is uh, a book I did with Jen Bendel called Deep Adaptation, Navigating the Realities of Climate Chaos. And I'm mentioning that because Jim, who is a, a trusted uh, friend and colleague, he and I don't see eye to eye about everything, uh, but so we have collegial disagreements even where we disagree. Jim has just produced something which I think is uh, quite important, which is a, a paper on where we're at in terms of the world uh, food situation. Uh, and this is going to be forthcoming in his, uh, in his book that's coming out uh, later this year. But um, if you want to read this chapter uh, on how he sees the world food situation based on the current research he and others have been doing, uh, you can find it very easily. For example, it's in his pinned tweet on, uh, on Twitter. And um, it's just come out. And so some, some of you are very likely not to be aware of it. So I thought it worth saying a few words about because I think it's quite an important uh, piece. And basically what Jim is doing in this paper is giving a systemic analysis of what I take to be, and I think he does too, uh, the single greatest threat we face in terms of the actual consequences for humanity of the climate and ecological crisis and decline uh, that we are in, the threat to the global uh, food system. Uh, this is a threat which is, uh, which is real and systemic and uh, multi-level. It would take me far too long to explain uh, all about it. And I recommend you to read the paper. But I just wanted to bring to your attention one of the key headlines, if you will, uh, of the paper, uh, which is that we are entering into a period where there is a much higher likelihood than there has been previously, um, orders of magnitude higher, 
uh, of what is called multi-bread multi basket failure. So the bread baskets of the world, places like uh, the Ukraine and uh, uh, parts of Argentina and the United States, the places where most of the world's grain uh, comes from, um, are becoming um, exponentially more vulnerable as we move into a climate chaotic world uh, and a world in which, of course, global temperatures uh, are increasing. Uh, and one of these um, bold and, and scary findings that uh, Jim has uh, in this uh, paper is that when we look at some of the world staples like uh, maize and, uh, and rice, uh, as well as, of course, wheat, um, what we find is that all of them are going to become um, far more vulnerable uh, once we pass 1.5 degrees of global overheat, which we are likely to do uh, probably in the next few years. There's no way now we're staying below 1.5 degrees, contrary to what you may have uh, heard from over-optimistic voices in the climate movement and among uh, scientists. And um, as I say, it's maize, it's rice, it's wheat, it's all the world's main uh, grains. Uh, one implication of this is that parts of the world that you might have thought were relatively invulnerable are uh, about to become quite vulnerable uh, on the food um, shock front. Uh, so because it includes, includes maize, um, uh, South America and Central America are about to become far more vulnerable to food shortages uh, than they have been. So you may be accustomed to thinking, well, food shortages, that's a matter for um, parts of Africa, parts of the Middle East, parts of Asia. Uh, it's not going to affect uh, the rest of the world. We are moving into a period uh, within this decade where it could certainly affect uh, Central and South America. And frankly, it could affect uh, anywhere. I'm speaking to you from the United Kingdom, uh, a country which is um, wealthy uh, and um, has a long history of uh, being able to um, sustain itself food-wise with food from abroad. Uh, we are chronically unable to uh, feed ourselves at the present time. It would take a great deal to change that situation. Uh, my view is that that is a chronically uh, unwise um, position to be in as we move into the very um, climatically and more generally unstable times that tragically we are moving into. The UK, um, may think, well, we're a rich country, we'll always be able to buy our way out of this. Um, but that is very unclear uh, in a future in which countries may bring in export bans uh, for their uh, main foods, as happened uh, in quite a number of countries in 2007 to 8, in a crisis that was mild compared to the kinds of food crises we're likely to see well within uh, the next uh, 10 years. Uh, and in terms of whether or not we can count on countries like the UK to be uh, well run uh, and stable um, through this period, uh, I think it's really interesting to compare um, the climate crisis with the, the COVID crisis uh, here. Uh, Amitav Ghosh um, uh, did a, a session with me online uh, last year uh, in which he made the very strong point um, that when we look at the, uh, the situation of countries like um, the US uh, and the UK um, through the uh, COVID crisis, um, it surprised many people how poorly these highly organized wealthy countries um, coped um, compared to countries such as, for example, um, some of the countries in West Africa, which had been through the Ebola uh, crisis uh, and had attained, attained some resilience and knowledge and understanding uh, through that, or some of the countries in East Asia, including poor countries like uh, Vietnam, uh, which coped basically far better than we did. Dougald Hine, some of you will be aware of, co-founder of the Dark Mountain Manifesto, uh, his very interesting new book, At Work in the Ruins, uh, he makes the argument that actually rich countries may be more vulnerable uh, than poor countries to these kinds of shocks as we saw uh, in COVID because their systems are more complex uh, and their um, levels of community uh, more diminished. So those kinds of comparisons to, to COVID should give us pause, us in the wealthy world, if we think that we're somehow immune to what is coming. So that's what I wanted to say by way of background, um, a slightly different angle on the seriousness of the crisis uh, that we're in. And now I want to move on to the main thing which I want to share with you uh, this evening before I turn it over to you for questions, which is uh, a way of thinking about how we respond uh, to this crisis. 
So you'll all be familiar with the fact that in uh, 2019, the uh, world's way of thinking about the environmental and climate em emergency uh, was changed forever by the bursting onto the stage of Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion and associated uh, movements uh, in, uh, in Europe and then spreading around the world. And uh, this gesture, this uh, movement of the Overton window, as it's called, by the radical flank to the environmental movement that I was proud to play a part in, uh, this has permanently uh, shifted things. But perhaps its most important effect, it seems to me, is what that now makes possible as a further set of moves. It is not uh, feasible that the radical flank of the environmental movement are going to win uh, hands down. They're never going to get they're never going to get enough people onto their side. They're never going to get enough of a plurality, let alone a majority of support uh, behind them. And in order to confront the awesome threat that is before us, it will not be enough in relation to uh, a situation like the climate and ecological uh, crisis to think that we can fix things at uh, an elite level um, or a level of tech uh, alone. The climate crisis saturates pretty much every aspect of our lives. Uh, it includes, for example, pretty much all aspects of agri agriculture, as I was talking about earlier, including things like pesticides and fertilizers, as well as obviously all the things that are, are directly involved in the, uh, in the fossil economy. If we're going to have a meaningful response to the climate crisis, it's going to take a very large percentage of the population. And that's why my new post XR project is to build what we're now calling a climate majority. We need to have a mass moderate flank to the environmental movement far bigger than the exciting innovations we saw with the school strikers and Extinction Rebellion. We need to have people being involved across the world, but within countries, we need to have people being involved across all different kinds of demographics. Uh, across groups that are never going to think of themselves as activists or never going to be involved in that kind of way. How will this be done? How could this possibly be done? Well, we can talk about uh, that uh, in more detail, but to give you some uh, a couple of outlines, uh, you might immediately start by thinking something as big as that. It's only going to happen if it's mobilized um, through the media or um, through government. It has to be something um, huge that can reach everybody, you might think. Well, I'm not so sure. I think we can't trust governments to lead on this. Uh, I think they're not going to do so. I think that is increasingly clear and makes the COP systems an incredibly hollow uh, process that we can have less and less uh, faith in. The people uh, need to lead. As for the media, well, the media is in a much better shape in dealing with these kind of crises in relation to how it was in, say, 2018, when on the BBC, for example, you still used to have uh, climate deniers be balancing uh, against uh, climate scientists or climate activists uh, in arguments and discussion programmes. But it's only relative, the change in the media. Relative to where we need to be, the media is still uh, miles um, off the pace. And in any case, does the kind of change that I'm talking about that has got to saturate people's lives. Does that actually happen through the kinds of changes that can be mobilized by governments alone or by um, elite top-down ways of uh, doing things such as we have in, uh, in broadcasting? And I put it to you that it doesn't. It has to actually involve people. It has to involve the people organically. It has to involve the mobilization of very large numbers of people. How do you do that in a situation which isn't actually a war type situation? How do you get people into a, a frame of mind where they want to be mobilized en masse in larger and larger numbers? The kinds of ways in which governments and the media uh, can mobilize people take place essentially through what sociologists call weak ties. There are weak ties, for example, between celebrity influencers uh, and those uh, that they uh, influence, or between authority figures uh, and those that they uh, influence. And there's only so much that you can do through weak ties. At the heart of the 
innovation that we're trying to put forward in building a mass moderate flank in building what we're now calling a climate majority, an actual majority of people who are ready to take the kind of action uh, that we need. At the heart of this is the idea that we need to mobilize the strong ties that exist between people and that so far have been barely exploited uh, in this struggle. So let me go into this term climate majority a little bit more. There is already a majority of people who accept that the climate crisis is serious uh, and want something done about it, want something meaningful done about it. But that majority is shallow and mostly unactivated. We need to deepen it, which we do partly by waking people up to just how serious the crisis is uh, in the kind of way that I did, for example, in the first six or seven minutes of this call. And we need to activate uh, that majority. But how do you do that? How do you activate people? How do you reach people in a way that they actually want en masse to make change? Well, as I've already hinted, I think you don't do it just by uh, top down uh, messages. You have to do it by reaching people through other people that they trust, that they that they know, that they feel some kind of identification with, that they want to be in solidarity with. So that's why what we're saying in the moderate flank, the new moderate flank, as we seek to build this climate majority, is that what we need to do is to reach people through the kind of strong ties that they have, that we all have. I mean things like our extended families. I mean our neighborhoods. I mean our workplaces, our businesses, our professions. I mean our religious organizations. In most of these locales, there has been as yet very little effort to mobilize people around climate and ecology. Most of the effort so far has either come through the media or has come through political organizations or has come through uh, NGOs or has come through green consumerism, which is essentially no ties at all. It's just relationships with objects rather than with uh, other people. What if we were to try to mobilize people through their actual lived relationships with each other, the kind of relationships that we have in our families or that parents uh, have with each other if they're uh, part of a, uh, a group of parents who are in a network uh, together or people who work together. So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to support. So for example, we are supporting, um, by we, I mean the Moderate Flank Incubator, which is the organization that I uh, co-direct. We are supporting uh, an organization called Lawyers for Net Zero, which is trying to get lawyers to organize as lawyers to undertake climate actions through the firm, the firms that they work with. Uh, another organization that we're incubating is called Community Climate Action, which is seeking to get people in communities to work together, to uh, work pieces of land uh, together, um, to form more resilient communities and to involve as much of the community as possible. So reaching out to people who are unlike themselves, but doing it in a way that involves face-to-face -face, uh, communication and that through that kind of strong tie uh, can achieve solidarity in ways that you simply cannot do through things like uh, Facebook, uh, let alone through um, ads or programs on, on television. Now you might say in response to this, and I'll stop after making this point, you might say in response to this, that sounds great, but it sounds like a lot of work and it sounds like it's gonna take a long time. Well, I think you'd be right. There is no quick fix. One implication of that is that contrary to the um, scientists and technologists and uh, the um, radical flank uh, activists uh, who sometimes say, well, we need a quick fix, we must have a quick fix, and we're going to deliver a quick fix. There is going to be uh, a lot of pain, there is going to be a lot of degradation, uh, and the chances of failure are high, the chances of collapse are high, the chances of um, fundamental change, including decline in the meantime, are pretty much 100%. But it seems to me that this is actually the best chance that we've got. If we mobilize these kinds of strong ties, and start to work through the population, getting a larger and a larger number until eventually we do have a deepened, activated climate majority, well, then we can actually win. We can actually undertake full-scale system 
transformation. And it's nothing less than that that is going to be required if we're going to get through this. So that's why I think that the argument that I've outlined to you in the last 20 minutes or so is our best shot, difficult though it's going to be, and much pain along the way, as though there is going to be. Thanks. And now over to you. I'm uh, fascinated to know what you think. Thank you. I feel fired up just hearing you speak about that. Um, so we are going to bring on a couple of people who will ask some questions and then we'll open it up. So if anybody has questions now, please do send them over to Peter Dines rather than myself at this point, and he's showing up as co-host. So let me introduce Jamie Shiplett, a volunteer for MIR. Jamie Shiplett received her bachelor's in geography and environmental planning from Towson University, where she completed an internship at NASA's DEVELOP program and conducted climatological research on tornadoes and El Nino, the socioeconomic impacts of Baltimore City's urban heat island and the impacts of climate change on viticulture in the Eastern United States. Jamie is currently pursuing a master's in public administration at the University of San Francisco, where she focuses her academics on climate change policy. We are also going to hear from Ranjita Weiswent. Ranjita is a public servant who lives in Oslo, Norway, and she has a passion to fight climate change. She works for the Arctic and Polar Department for the Government of Canada. Climate change is number one challenge for the region. All right, so you can go ahead, Jamie. Um, yeah, Rupert, thank you for being here. Um, your talk was really thought provoking and it um, stems some questions that I've had for a long time about how to get um, the mass majority of people involved. Mm -hmm. um, so I just have some thoughts for you because I don't really have many questions, but I have some thoughts. Um, so when I was in my undergrad, I was in the climate alarmist phase and I would go into my professor's offices and you know have that like alarmist sort of notion. And they said, Jamie, this isn't really a way to get things done because you're just going to scare people. And people, when they're scared, typically don't take action. And it made me consider how when it comes when it comes to explaining climate change, how to explain it in layman terms, but also explain it in a way that provides solution and hope. So my thought for you is, um, I guess, question is I, exploring the ways that you can, you know, uh, I guess, verbalize your message and get the message across to your audiences, while yeah. also keeping like it, people hopeful at an individual level. I think that that's the most challenging thing to do. And to also un, like help people realize that this problem isn't larger than them. And it's something that involves collaboration and input from all different sectors and ethnicities and regions. So I think that that may be the most challenging part is it getting down to the individual level of mm. people. Thanks, Jamie. Really, really interesting, really important. So look, I think it's right to say that if all you do is uh, is scare people, then you haven't achieved very much. Uh, what people need is a container uh, around uh, their fear, uh, something which um, gives it a context which makes it uh, manageable. What does that container look like? Well, it can look like all sorts of different things, but but roughly it has to include um, offering people ways of uh, handling uh, their their fear, uh, offering them meaningful um, off ramps from the fear um, into action, which responds to the fear, and offering them a sense that that action could add up to something sufficient that it will actually address the causes of the fear. And what we think in the new moderate flank is that unless you have all of those uh, things, you don't have very much, actually. Uh, and that the problem has been sometimes in the past that uh, fear has been agitated for without any serious effort to help people to handle it, without any serious effort to provide them with um, meaningful actions that they can take which rise to it. 
and without giving them a sense that those actions actually add up to a row of beans. Um, so when um, fear is generated, for example, from um, a film, say, like The Day After Tomorrow or something like that, you know, an isolated big media uh, event, um, what, what is that? Where are the um, off ramps from, from that into action? You know, that typically there, there aren't any. Where is the kind of holding context for dealing with those fears? Again, typically uh, there isn't one. And by the way, when I talk about off ramps into action, as I've already implied, that the action has to be something which actually rises to the scale of the occasion. So, so if, for example, you give people a very scary uh, message, uh, and then you say to them, so look, it's really important that you take shorter showers um, because then you'll use up a bit less carbon uh, dioxide. You know, everybody knows that that's not going to cut it. Uh, that everyone knows that that's a kind of uh, irrelevant thing to say virtually in, in conjunction with the, the level of the fear that's been uh, generated. So you have to offer something that's really substantial and serious. And, you know, that's what I'm seeking to, to offer something which could actually rise to the occasion, something which could actually be uh, in toto big enough. And it's being gonna be constituted by loads and loads of small things. It's gonna be constituted by loads and loads of people stepping up to organize uh, where they have some kind of power or influence and recognizing that there are other people doing the same thing and recognizing that the same sort of thing is starting to happen all over the place because it is starting to happen all over the place. Right, this this climate majority that I'm that I'm talking about uh, being uh, deepened and uh, activated, um, that is starting to to happen. And one of the things that we're trying to do is simply to to name it and bring some kind of common awareness to the way that a phenomenon like um, uh, lawyers for net zero and uh, community climate action uh, and some of what's going on in the space of uh, of insurance and some of the exciting things that the uh, that woken up uh, advertisers are starting to do to change the way that their industry has been a force for evil into something which could be a force for good. Once you start to see how all of these things kind of different that they are, they all kind of point in broadly the same direction. Well, that's when you start to get into a situation where, situation where you might actually be able to have some hope, it seems to me. And when you do have all of that, then it seems to me that the absolutely appropriate thing to do uh, is to uh, create fear. Because if you're not afraid, you're not paying attention, at least some of the time. If you're not scared with what's going on, then you're not paying full, full attention or you don't know actually the full scale of the gravity of the situation. What we need to do is enable people to face that full gravity uh, and enable them to face it together uh, in such a way that they actually feel able to face it and able to live with that and able to process it. And some of the time it's going to be kind of very painful and disorienting. I had a, had a very nasty little episode of, uh, of uh, climate anxiety and sort of climate despair uh, uh, last week. Um, but uh, it only lasted about um, 12 uh, hours or so, uh, including the night. Uh, and uh, by the end of that, I was sort of uh, uh, back on the road uh, uh, again, back on the uh, back on the trail again, um, realizing that um, uh, what I'm trying to do and what a lot of us are trying to do is, you know, a historic, exciting, uh, important task in which we can take uh, joy. Um, but yeah, I would say fear is absolutely necessary. Fear is good. Fear is real, but only if it has this kind of container, this context around it. Thank you, Rupert. I, yeah, just consider the fear and how it can kind of debilitate people in a way. And I, so I guess my suggestion is just to, I guess, keep it in, try to keep it simple for people to take action because I think that's where the discrepancy comes in is that the problem can seem too large and that that even in itself can sort of cripple people's efforts. Yeah, but look, the, the point I was trying to make about, about the, the kind of correspondence that there needs to be, the congruence there needs to be between the problem and the solution is that 
is that the problem really is a very huge one. I mean, it's, it's bigger mm. than a problem. It's a predicament. It's a it's a tragedy. Um, it's a, con- a more or less permanent condition that we're basically never going to get out, get out of. It's going to define uh, the lives of all of us more and more. And people increasingly sense that. Uh, so what what they need to be offered is something that rises to the scale of that. So what what I was getting at when I mentioned like shorter showers is what you mustn't do is say, OK, you're feeling some fear. OK, here's something you can do about it, because most of the hear something you can do about it. You know, send this postcard to a, uh, to a politician, uh, buy this different kind of car. Most of these things are patently inadequate. And at some level, people know that. So you have to try to make sure that the action is actually meaningful. And it seems to me the only way we can get an action which is sufficiently meaningful is if it's one um, small but potentially significant and scalable part of something huge uh, and transformative. And yeah, as I say, that's what we're we're trying to suggest is, is the way we can think about it. Okay, thank you, Rupert. Thank you. Thanks. Ranjita, would you like to go ahead? Yes, yeah, sure. <clears throat> thank you, Rupert, for that insightful talk. I'm just representing myself here as a concerned citizen of the planet Earth, not my government, not my employer. Um, I wanted to say that um, people used to say, oh, climate change is the elephant in the room. I say climate change is a rhinoceros coming straight to us. And there is no time to escape because we are just heading, it's coming straight to us. And um, so I think I love your grassroots level. It's important, but climate change has arrived at such a stage, at least in the region where I work, it's going to devastate. It's going to take away the livelihoods of the people. And we are talking about polar bears and Inuits and indigenous and a lot of stuff because Mm. The Canadian North, Alaska, they're all sitting on permafrost, which is starting to melt. So we are going to see huge devastation. We are going to see so much which will change. So there is no time. I mean, I love grassroots. That's where we all started. But I think policy making, that's what I told the minister. And I'm telling again, and I'm telling everybody around me, we need to fight so that our politicians change the policy in every step of governance. That's the only way we are going to change because if you wait for people and their opinion, you're done because there will be disinformation and there will be people who will be against it and all sorts of nonsense will happen. But climate change is not going to wait for that at all. It's coming, it's going to take over. There will be drought, there's famine. You mentioned all these fantastic things which are going to happen and affect all of us. Food prices went up 11% in the month of February. It's expensive. Norway doesn't produce its own food. The import. Many countries import. As you said, maybe poorer countries will fare better than the richer countries. We are paying so much more for anything. Tomatoes, anything, potatoes. It's going to be catastrophic. There will be inflation. So we are talking about that every government we elect in every country, we have to, our government people, the politicians, the prime minister, the presidents have to take into account that it is the most important subject we are dealing with. And actually they have started taking into account the US government, I think I sent it to Peter, they just had for the first time ever a climate scientist in the panel, which talks with produce every week. So you can imagine that it is a serious thing. US has started taking take into account because the whole defense structure, which is up there in the North will be affected. So now climate change is in the defense strategies of defense, naval, any strategies. It, it is the number one point because <clears throat> that's what we're going to see. And I think I'm really worried about uh, the world, the way we are heading because if we don't do something from now, we have no more time left. So we are heading towards climate apocalypse. I'm sorry to be an alarmist, but that's what's going to happen if we do nothing. If our politicians do nothing, if we elect governments which do nothing. So it's every citizen's role to, to elect the people who will make changes in the policy. I mean, I'm just a, a little player, but that's what I think and I feel for it. Mm. 
Well, look, thank you so much, Ranjita, and thank you for the important work that you're doing. And I hope it succeeds and all, and the many people who are doing similar important work. And of course, much of what you've said is, is right. Um, it's right, for example, that people ought to um, make these different political choices, uh, that they ought to uh, vote better, um, that there ought to be um, policy level um, solutions um, to most of this. But I do want to put it to you, as I already said briefly earlier in my talk, that it requires a really huge act of faith to think that that is actually what's going to happen. Um, so I was at uh, COP26, for example, in uh, in Glasgow. I was there with Ye Tao, um, the founder of, uh, of Mir. Uh, and um, what he and I and everybody else who was there saw, if they were willing to, to open their eyes and take it in, uh, was a really pitiful failure to step up to the plate at a crucial moment uh, in history. The Glasgow COP is supposed to be the COP which actually put into practice what the what the amazing diplomatic achievement of the Paris Agreement had uh, set up as, as a theory. And it fell very, very short of doing so. Um, that is one of the kind of key moments in recent years. Our Prime Minister at the time, Boris Johnson, um, said at the start of the COP, start of COP26, it's one minute to midnight, he said. We've still got time to make changes, um, but you know this it's pretty much the last chance saloon. Well, you know what? Sooner or later, when you miss the last chance saloons, you've missed them. And one of my fundamental points is we cannot go on saying it's five minutes to midnight, it's one minute to midnight. It's not. It's past midnight. We are, as you said, uh, heading straight down the road to an apocalyptic situation. And that's what I sought to evoke in my remarks at the start of my talk about the food crisis that we are lurching our way into, which most people, I think, still have no idea about, really. Uh, and that's part of what we need to deepen our sense of reality and truth uh, with regard to. So you're right that we are out of time. But I'm afraid I don't share the faith uh, any longer that there is any good reason to think that there will be, in the ordinary sense of the word, political um, solutions to this. Now, I'm not saying that that means that the work you're trying to do is not important. I meant what I said at the start of my answer to you. I think it's, uh, I, I, I respect it and I think it has an importance. But the importance, it seems to me, is primarily just to make the terrible situation that we're in a bit less bad. That's what it seems to me the political process right now is capable of doing. But that isn't enough. So how do we get more? And my claim, my suggestion is that the way we get more uh, is by creating uh, an epochal uh, movement of, uh, of movements bigger than anything we've seen um, before which operates a great deal through strong ties, and so takes quite a while um, to build. And now you respond, but we don't have time. Um, but unfortunately, there's nothing better that we can do. Um, that means there is gonna be enormous suffering and devastation uh, over the next 10 to 20 years. And I see absolutely no way around that. And um, that's part of what we have to prepare for. And that is part of the, the, the wake up call and the very painful reality readjustment that we have to start to go in for. How can we get to a point, because I think we can, but how can we get to a point where the political process actually works in the way that you want it to? The most, the most obvious way, unless there is a revolution, um, is for there to be a, a thorough change in the political class, the political class in Norway, in the UK, the political class across the world. We need a whole new set of politicians to replace the failing ones uh, who we have. How do you get a whole new political class? Well, frankly, you need a new electorate. I mean, the voters that we have are not gonna vote in completely different parties and completely different people. Now, how do you get a new electorate? That sounds impossible, that sounds absurd, that sounds like a joke. I'll tell you how you get a new electorate. You get a new electorate through profound transformational cultural change. You get it through reaching people one by one uh, through their hearts, through networks where they're connected to other people, through their families, 
through their neighborhoods, through their workplaces, et cetera, and through people experiencing, through making, seeking to make direct change in those places, uh, the kind of macro change in embryo um, that we need. So that is what we are proposing. We are proposing to build a climate majority uh, by creating um, a new electorate through this uh, too slow process, but nevertheless, the fastest process that it is credible to imagine that will actually work. Now, you said it's very going to be very difficult to do that because you've got disinformation, we've got uh, bad populist leaders, etc. Well, you're, again, you're right. Uh, and the implication of that is the only way we're going to successfully build this kind of movement is by doing it in ways that are, again, new in being unpolarizing or, in fact, anti-polarizing. So, for example, we need to appeal to um, parents as parents by making them understand the threat that faces their, their children um, in such a way that they respond from a place that is deeper than the kinds of polarities that have been dividing our societies uh, in the last few years. This is going to be incredibly hard. But again, I don't think there is any alternative, given that to have the kind of fundamental change that we need, it needs to permeate most of society. I say again, there is no elite level solution to the climate crisis in the way that there was an elite level solution to the ozone hole issue. You could sort that out through having an intergovernmental agreement and getting various corporations to act differently. Um, there is no analogy to that in a climate crisis. It has to involve the majority of the people. So. That's the way we're going to do it if we do it. We're going to build a climate majority in, in ways that are unpolarizing and, in fact, uh, anti-polarizing. And we're going to build it on the basis of the awareness that it is five past midnight, that we are uh, out of time. Uh, and the best time to start this process was 30 years ago, but the second best time uh, is right now. I would just like to <clears throat> make a point, quick point was that not every size fits all. My kids, the 10 years old twins, they go to school and they know about climate change. They, mm -hmm, they are mm -hmm. doing their bit. Actually, I told yes. them, you know what? Mommy's going to ask a question on climate change. I said it in Norwegian, Klima Endring. And they said, Mommy, surely say that polar bears are in danger. Mm. They said that to me. So please yeah. do mention polar bears are in danger. So in Nor there's probably a difference between Norwegians and uh, I don't know much about UK, UK and Norway politics, but here my kids know about climate change. My kids know it's a danger. My kids know that we have to yeah, get ready but, for this. But, sure, of course. But remember what I said earlier, right? We already <laughs> have a climate majority. Right? That's that's part of the good news, right? Uh, the problem is it's uh, it's shallow and it's not sufficiently active. It's stronger among younger people, which is great and shows enormous promise uh, towards the future. But of course, um, younger people uh, don't have a great deal of conventional power. And it'll be quite a long time before before they do. And as it were, we don't have that time. But nevertheless, uh, this is the best that we can do. So part of what it's going to be to uh, to create this uh, this new electorate, which can give us a new political class, is by uh, is by harnessing the power of the of Generation Greta and so forth. Absolutely. But let's not be under uh, an illusion that that's going to happen uh, overnight or that it's going to be um, easy. But these kids are going to be the future electorate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're in agreement about that. But mm -hmm. um, look, you know, we're supposed to if, if we were if we were if we're going to stay below two degrees of global overheat, which is you know very, very difficult uh, now, uh, that requires um, transformative change uh, within the next uh, decade. So unfortunately, 10-year-old, um, uh, 15-year-old children are not in a position to implement that. Um, what they can mainly do is do the kind of thing that they did um, heroically through the school climate strikes, which is to chant things like save our world uh, and tug on our heartstrings, etc., as they've never been tugged on uh, before and tell the truth and, uh, and emote and start to, to shame essentially their parents and their parents' generation uh, into action. So that's why I say that one of the main things that we need now uh, is a massive parents' movement is parents uh, becoming active as parents because they realize it's not possible tragically for them to defend their children anymore uh, in the traditional way alone. You can't um, look after your children and give them a good life just by kind of bringing them up well and putting them in a good school and so on and so forth. Unless um, things change uh, at the macro level, 
um, things are going to be swept away for many of our children, irregardless of how good uh, an upbringing uh, we give them. So this is why, um, as we've had uh, a kind of mobilization of our children, we now need an even bigger uh, and more um, powerful, literally powerful, mobilization of, uh, of parents. And that's going to be, in my view, an essential um, aspect of uh, the building of this mass moderate flank, this climate majority. That's what this book that um, was mentioned at the start by Kai's uh, Parents for a Future uh, is about. This is a sort of kind of manifesto, if you will, for, for the building of the kind of climate majority that I'm talking about on this call. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. And we'd like to now ask a few questions from our community that have been coming in. Uh, you just were talking about what youth, you know, what events youth could do. And the question came in from Glenn, what kinds of events can we create in our communities to form this? Well, you mentioned it is a majority, but to, you know, to strengthen it. How can we use social media? And can we influence large businesses? Is that a realistic um, you know, goal? Yeah, yeah. So of course we can use social media. Of course we can influence large businesses. But again, the question we need to ask ourselves is, is the kind of difference we'll make by doing that going to be a sort of a bit of a difference which will be helpful? Or is it the kind of difference that could actually be enough? I mean, enough to stop our current trajectory into collapse. Um, and in order for what we do to be enough, uh, and this, by the way, is, is something kind of great that Winston Churchill famously once said. He said, sometimes it's not enough to try your best. You actually have to do enough. Uh, in order to actually do uh, enough, we have to think, OK, how do we get to have a really substantial uh, change by way of social media or by way of um, of influencing um, the business world. So let's take uh, business. So um, some of the businesses that I'm starting to work with and that we're starting to work with in trying to build this uh, this climate majority are uh, the kinds of businesses that you'll be aware of as businesses that are trying to do the right, really are trying to do the right thing, trying to um, uh, green uh, themselves and their operations and so forth. And there's this whole set of questions that businesses need to ask themselves and to be asked. And those are questions like, uh, what is your product? You know, is your product something which is making the world a better place or not? Um, uh, what are the um, emissions and what are the vulnerabilities in your, uh, in your supply chain? Um, what are you lobbying for? How are you using your lobbying power? Are you lobbying for uh, regulatory exemptions or are you lobbying for a, a level playing field for a higher, much higher level playing field for everyone to stop bad uh, uh, climate actors, et cetera? What are you doing with your brand power? Are you encouraging people to be um, selfish and consumeristic or are you encouraging them to be uh, very different in their orientation? These are incredibly challenging questions um, for, for businesses. But what we need, uh, it seems to me, most of all, um, is not things like um, people thinking, oh, well, I'll buy from this business rather than that business because this business has slightly better products. Of course, you know, every, every little can help. Of course, um, green consumerism and ethical consumerism is better than doing nothing at all. But we know that it isn't going to be enough. So what we actually need people to do is to engage um, much more directly uh, with businesses. What does that mean? Well, it means things like, using these kind of strong ties, is there someone in a business uh, who you know, who you could actually have a frank conversation about some of this with? Or is there uh, a business that you could set up um, which would actually do this kind of thing uh, and, uh, and do it uh, uh, properly? Um, or are there ways in which we could actually succeed in mobilizing businesses and others in politics in other kinds of ways to actually force some of these kinds of changes? That's hard, but it's the kind of thing we must we must consider It's when you start to ask those kinds of questions, you know, who could I actually influence that would really potentially do the right thing? Um, or who are the influencers if they're not me? So I mentioned lawyers for net zero before. So corporate lawyers play a very, a very important role in corporations. General counsel, they're called. They're the leading lawyers uh, in a corporation. 
uh, and they will um, they will be listened to uh, by the board because the board wants to know whether or not what they're going to be doing is going to be legal. Um, so if those general counsels start to make warnings, like, for example, you should be aware that if you don't think ahead about such and such, you'll be vulnerable to being retrospectively sued in about five years time for um, for um, whatever, corporate manslaughter or something because of your uh, emissions. Um, if a corporate lawyer, if a, if a general counsel um, says that and then influences another general counsel who could say that, that's the kind of thing that could really uh, make a difference. We have to be asking, how do we actually make differences which are significant enough? That's the, that's the kind of thing I I'd like everyone on the call to be thinking about. You know, where is that? There are, there's loads of things that all of us can do and should do in our lives. You know, we can think about what products we buy and how we vote and uh, a million things. But where are the places in your life where you have really significant potential leverage or influence? And it might be somebody who you know, or it might be that you have a lot of money that you could put to far better use, or it might be um, something that you could uh, create. It might be something which uh, has a potential real uh, leverage on people's hearts and minds. This is one of the reasons why I think the community climate action is very important, because when people see other people in their community starting to prepare for the hard years that are coming and starting to build community and to build uh, material and psychological resilience, they start to think, oh, my God, it really is real. You know, this isn't about... 2050 or a problem that's going to be facing our grandchildren this is here it, it's coming it's right here it's going to affect us it's going to affect us more so community climate action it might seem incredibly humble uh, but it actually has this potential enormous power of going off inside the minds and inside the hearts of uh, everyone who lives in or near uh, that community as they start to realize how real the problem is and start to see what it is concretely on the ground that they can do about it. So mm -hmm. the, the question in a way that all of us need to ask ourselves is what, is what is the work that is mine to do? What is the work that is ours to do? How do we best enter into service in relation to this epochal challenge, which is the only thing actually that when they talk about this kind of thing with us, our children will, will be really serious and demanding about in 10, 20, 30 years time. The question they will ask us, and they will ask this question, and you will ask it of yourselves is, what did I do when there was time and maximum leverage once I knew? Uh, it's really the only question. Uh, and what we each need to figure out is what is the, the one or maybe two ways in which we can exert maximum leverage as part of this joined up struggle? Mm, mm -hmm. This this next question, it sounds like what you're talking about is making us all into activists, but maybe not calling everybody an activist. We're going to take yeah. action. And what is that action that we can take exactly. that will have a ripple effect? Yes. Um, Patrick asked the question and wondering how to understand activated in the context of these ideas about a moderate majority. How do we identify and think about somebody being meaningfully activated who is by definition, not an activist? Great question. Seems like so, what so you were important. just speaking about. Yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. along that vein. No, I'm delighted that the question has been asked because this is absolutely essential to our mission, to what we're trying to do in building the, uh, uh, the deep activated climate majority. Look, in the 2020s, there are definitely going to be more climate activists. There are definitely going to be more green activists. This problem isn't going to go away. It's going to keep on gradually getting bigger and bigger. And that's great that there are going to be more climate activists in the years that are coming. But there are never going to be enough, uh, and they are never going to um, influence everybody. Uh, many people will never, ever get to the point where they will be or even think of becoming or think of identifying with. Uh, activists. We need to provide serious ramps going into action for many people who are never going to be activists. So it's about, so this is why I use the term activation, uh, or why I talk about taking action. Sometimes I use the, the slightly awkward but helpful phrase, doists, we need to become doists, uh, not just activists, I mean, we need to do stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and so exactly what we need to do is provide ways uh, creatively for ourselves, for others, 
for many people which don't look like activism but do involve positively getting getting stuff done and you know what the the good thing is that that is what most people want to do they want to do positive stuff for most people it isn't enough to uh, to protest uh, or complain, uh, however righteously, what people are actually hungry for is ways in which they can meaningfully make uh, a positive difference. And many of these ways, as I say, it might seem as though they're not enough and they're never going to add up. But what you have to imagine is firstly, um, them joining up and scaling up on a vast stage. And secondly, that some of these things, as I've already said, can have an effect far beyond their direct material effect. So again, on community climate action, um, it's so important because it acts as a much bigger wake up call. If we had a lot more people doing community climate action, if we had a lot more people um, seeking to create orchards uh, where they live and community supported agriculture and all these kinds of things, um, uh, eco villages, et cetera. Um, if we had a lot more of that, um, it would be um, making a direct positive change, it'd be modelling what the future needs to be like, it would be building resilience, and perhaps most importantly of all, it would be acting as a constant growing uh, wake-up call and, and reality check. Um, the kind of work that we can do that involves creative, transformative adaptation to our plight is, in my opinion, the most important work of all that we can do now for many of us. Um, so. At the policy level, for example, and scientists have often concentrated on the issues of so-called mitigation, uh, the issues of, of uh, seeking to prevent um, the, the crisis from reaching a sufficiently bad stage. Well, it has now reached a very bad stage. It is going to get a lot worse. Um, it is too late to avoid taking adaptation seriously now. And the good thing is, as we do take it seriously, and as we take it seriously from the bottom up, as we engage in transformative adaptation, community climate action, as businesses, for example, start to attend seriously to questions about adaptation, how resilient is my supply chain, this kind of question, um, it is going to act as a huge lived wake up call. And as a result of that, it is going to increase pressure for real political action to be taken. It is going to increase pressure, pressure for there to be so-called mitigation for, and for us to take tar targets on the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, etc., uh, much more seriously. Mm hmm. So let's, uh, well, one, one person was act asking about what a lawyer group could be advocating for specifically, um, a group of lawyers, you know, what, what mm. would they, what could be a concrete step that a group of lawyers could advocate for? Sure. So there's all sorts of important um, possibilities within the law. Uh, anyone who is on the call who is involved with the law, uh, I'd urge you to take this fully seriously if you're not already doing so. But also, actually, you don't even have to be a, a lawyer. The person who uh, dreamed up Lawyers for Net Zero and um, uh, is now the CEO of it, he's not a lawyer. Uh, he is a former colleague of mine from Extinction Rebellion and the co-creator uh, with me of the, of the moderate flank uh, concept. Uh, and he saw the potential in the law and started to move to activate lawyers and he created this organization lawyers for net zero I, i've already explained very briefly some of how lawyers for net zero operates it operates through uh businesses through trying to pressure businesses from the inside and through building up solidarity between corporate lawyers in particular between uh general counsel but there are other important possibilities for how the law can work and can make a meaningful a really meaningful difference. Uh, one that uh, many of you will be familiar with, um, it, which is quite well known now because it's having some real effects, um, is um, the use of the law to actually um, hit corporates and governments and others uh, who are bad actors. So um, litigation, basically, climate litigation, eco uh, litigation, hugely significant, hugely valuable, um, a really good way to uh, invest money uh, a really good way to invest uh, time. Never going to be enough by itself because the law um, will um, not catch up to where we need to be uh, until um, at the very least we have um, deep activated climate majorities uh, uh, created, but significant nonetheless. 
And there are other things that lawyers can do as well. Lawyers can do uh, pro bono work for, for climate protesters. Lawyers can um, uh, refuse to represent various clients. That's very controversial within the law. That's quite a radical thing uh, for lawyers um, uh, to do, but they can take steps um, uh, in that direction. And some lawyers now um, are doing that. Um, so there's a very interesting new organization, which is a sort of, it's on the it's on the sort of radical fringe of the of the moderate flank, as I see it. It's called Lawyers Are Responsible, which is a quite a clever and interesting name if you think about it. So the idea is lawyers are responsible for quite a lot of the trouble indirectly um, uh, that we are in because uh, lawyers have you know stood up for all sorts of bad guys and and uh, and represented them, and uh, the law hasn't exactly been um, on the forefront of getting this right uh, so far. But lawyers are also responsible in the sense of lawyers are people who typically um, go into what they do with a sense of uh, right and wrong, with a sense at minimum of the importance of being on the right side of the of the law. That should include being on the right side of, uh, of international law and being on the right side of history, being on the right side of ethics. It's fascinating, for example, to look at what lawyers did under the Nazi regime in Germany. So you might think... Um, well, um, the Nazi regime, um, totalitarian regime, you know, people would have been terrified um, if they didn't go along with everything the Nazis wanted, that they would end up being tortured themselves and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, there are some very interesting uh, cases uh, of lawyers, uh, judges, um, for example, um, doing the right thing and saying, um, OK, uh, you're forcing me to send this uh, Jewish person to, to prison for such and such and so on. But actually, you know, I don't accept that this is a, a, a valid uh, instance of the law. And, 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 uh, and in that way, going against the Nazi authorities, if some um, decent uh, lawyers and judges could find ways of standing up against that regime, surely we can stand up against the regime that we are. Uh, uh, are under. These are some key examples just of how uh, the law and lawyers can be um, really quite significant. It can make a big difference. You know, imagine if a load of lawyers found ways of saying that they're not going to um, take on um, uh, fossil fuel clients, uh, for example. Imagine if lawyers inside firms really moved to make those firms um, um, climate compliant, uh, even ahead of the law, with a view to the way the law is likely to change uh, uh, in the coming years. Imagine if we had 10 times as much uh, climate and eco litigation uh, as we currently uh, do against governments, uh, against big corporates. Um, these kinds of things could uh, start to be game changers. Mm -hmm. Well, we have maybe just two more questions, um, and then we'll finish up. Something from Anton, given that it's very unlikely to avoid crossing some tipping points, like with the ice sheets, without climate interventions, should the moderate flank focus more on promoting intervention research and development in addition to tackling emissions um, and other? So I assume we have in mind here things like uh, the MIA um, proposal. Um, obviously, I'm aware who I'm speaking with uh, here the, this evening under those under which auspices I am. So let me say something briefly uh, about that. So uh, I'm on record as being strongly opposed to uh, geoengineering. I think geoengineering is uh, is reckless and uh, dangerous. I think the issues of moral hazard are, are pretty decisive. Uh, and you can read more about that, for example, in my contribution to the book Facing Up to Climate Reality, uh, which goes into this in detail. But uh, I think that what there is to be said for the for the mere proposal uh, is that I don't think it really counts as being geoengineering uh, in that sense, in my sense. It's not an attempt to control the climate of the whole planet in the way that bunging up um, uh, stratospheric sulfates or whatever uh, uh, would be and would be, in my opinion, a highly uh, reckless, utterly last ditch um, uh, uh, attempt uh, to deal with the uh, the more than problem uh, that we're in. It's much more than a problem, as we said uh, earlier. So I'm open to the use of, uh, of uh, technical and technological interventions uh, such as me, or at least on an experimental basis and on a relatively uh, local uh, basis. Um, my, uh, you, many of you will know far more about the, the details of, of how something like Mia might work uh, than, uh, than I do. Uh, but uh, I would say that I have some 
I have some concerns and question marks still, which is why I stress the word experimental. Uh, I think there is some reason to uh, believe that there could be unanticipated knock-ons to, to weather, which could be quite problematic if Mia started to be rolled out uh, in large amounts of, uh, of heat reflection and, uh, and mirroring. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the devil may well be in the detail, but I am open in principle to uh, those kinds of uh, interventions being used, provided that they're uh, relatively controllable uh, and local local uh, or most regional uh, and not attempts which are entirely uh, hubristic, in my opinion, to try to control the whole Earth's climate. Why don't I put more emphasis on these kinds of interventions? Well, it's really because of this. I think that um, if we think that these interventions can be anything more than just kind of partial tools that may help us to stave off um, problems uh, for uh, a while and make things a bit less bad, I think we're we're running the risk of not thinking systemically or transformatively enough. As I've tried to indicate in my remarks on, on this call, uh, we need to have really a, a, a thoroughly different um, civilizational mindset. Uh, if we are not, for example, to just create uh, new problems on the back of the of the old uh, problems, it's entirely possible here to go from a uh, frying pan to uh, to to fire. Um, uh, if we don't get out of the mindset which got us into the problem, which is a mindset of thinking that we can basically um, uh, pollute, defile, exploit our um, ecosystems as much as we want, uh, because we're so powerful, we'll all find ways of coping technologically with those um, with those damages. It seems to me that we need a much more fundamental transformation uh, that is not going to come quickly. Therefore, there is going to be enormous suffering and damage uh, along the way and quite probably collapse. We probably uh, uh, will collapse, although I'm still obviously very much hoping that we won't and aiming for us not to. Uh, and if we do, we can make the collapse far less bad by preparing uh, uh, for it and by building uh, resilience, et cetera. But if we put too much emphasis on uh, too many eggs in the basket of these kinds of technological uh, innovations, then it seems to me we won't take seriously the other side of the, the coin here, which is even more important, which is engaging in those kinds of um, endeavors towards uh, a transformed mindset and a transformed way of being, putting ourselves in a position such that we don't uh, make the next uh, mistake uh, in line and don't set off another whole set of unintended consequences. So it really is in the final analysis about taking precaution um, seriously. Ultimately, what we need to do is to build down, is to systematically reduce our damaging effects on our planetary uh, home and on our local uh, places where we live, uh, etc. Not to think that we can continue to damage and find technical fixes to get us out of that damage. Yeah, that's a very important point. Well, um... I just want to end with this kind of picture of the future. Rebecca asks, what would a future look like if the climate majority has the power? Um, you know, what what do you envision? Wow, what a great about growing great question. food, you know, what you yeah, mentioned earlier yeah, yeah. about growing food and the way that the world works. Yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. So obviously to give a full answer to that would take several days. Uh, and as we only have a couple of minutes, I won't try a full answer. Um, but what I will say is this, uh, such a hugely important question. I do think we have to have that that uh, that kind of positive vision, which we're trying to develop at the moment, and I'm very much uh, trying to uh, uh, develop it. Um, we also have to accept that we don't have full control over the situation that we're in. We never have full control, but we have uh, um, much less than anything like full control um, because of our deficient uh, human systems and because of the damage we've already injected into the world um, system. So an implication of that is, as I've as I implied, we may seek to transform uh, our systems and our future. We probably won't fully succeed and we may well have to endure some kind of collapse or partial collapse uh, uh, events. So really what I want to say in answer to the question right now is to distinguish between um, the possibilities which are, which are present in my little book that was mentioned earlier by you guys, uh, this civilization is finished. It's really important to understand here that the emphasis is on the word uh, this. 
Uh, it doesn't mean civilization is bound uh, uh, to collapse. It doesn't mean that at all. What it means is that we cannot go on as we are doing. And that the longer we try to go on as we are doing, the more certain it is that our civilization will collapse. And that in order to avoid uh, collapse, we need to transform um, everything, which means that it will no longer be in any meaningful sense, this civilization that we are still uh, in. Uh, and that if we do endure some kind of collapse and manage to be prepared enough for it, that we manage to uh, in some way recover from it, again, obviously, it'll be a very, very different civilization. So whichever way you cut the, the cake, this civilization is finished. Um, and the, the, um, the future we, we can look forward to is either a future in which um, we've endured some kind of collapse, but we've managed to... Um, uh, be transformative enough uh, in the run up to it that it's not been um, terminal uh, and that we found uh, ways uh, through it. And if we've done that, it will be because of something like uh, a deepened, activated climate majority having made uh, a huge amount of uh, change to take us off our, our current uh, trajectory, which is just directly uh, into uh, collapse. Or better still, it will be because we've actually managed to transform enough to uh, avoid uh, collapse uh, altogether. And if it looks like that, then I think we can safely say a few things about what that's going to look like concretely. Um, the world is going to be um, a lot more uh, local. Um, there will be uh, much more of a sense of uh, what life is for and what we're here for. People will have found a huge amount of purpose through this massive common struggle that we're now uh, starting to um, uh, embark upon. Um, we will be much less uh, technologically hubristic. Um, there won't be um, a fantasy anymore of uh, endless uh, growth or so-called endless progress. Um, uh, and we will have much more of a sense of our own uh, vulnerability and of the beauty and preciousness of life. Now, there, there will probably be um, less material ease than there is uh, for some of us uh, in rich countries at the present time. But I hope that the picture that I very, very briefly sketched there is a picture that nevertheless has quite a lot of attractions to it. And I think that is you know, the point on which I'd like to, to end, that as we go into this, um, this epochal time of transformation, which is going to either involve some better or worse kind of collapse or involve us managing to come through what, what's coming without uh, collapse. It's going to be a time of a potential enormous um, meaning uh, and a lot of things uh, amidst the, the horror and the damage uh, are potentially going to get better. Uh, and uh, perhaps that's quite an encouraging thought. That is indeed to leave us with that. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your and your guidance. Um, and I hope that you know you will have some book sales. You've held up your held up your books, and <laughs> we do want yeah people to purchase those. Um, thank you so much for active you know getting helping us to know how we can take small steps that will have ripple effects and really activate a broader majority. Mm. Thanks, Kaiser. Thanks, everybody. This has been a really useful discussion, as I was sure it would be before we started. So it has proven. And um, yeah, remember what I said, uh, find what is yours to do and uh, and let's do it. Let's make the, let's make this thing happen as best we can. Thank you. At MIR, we are working to help educate the public while also developing some solutions, um, temporary. <laughs> to warming of the planet. We invite you to keep learning about Earth's energy imbalance and climate science on our first principles and FAQs pages. And as you may know, we are almost a 100% volunteer staff with only a few paid student researchers. So please do consider making a monthly donation of any amount. And you can see us, see our YouTube channel, at Mir SRM. We also have a Facebook page. So we invite you to share what you've learned, what you've become motivated about from today's talk. And we hope to see you again next month on Sunday, April 2nd.
keep that in your calendar. Thank you so much for coming. Bye for now.